Thank you, Becky. Um, so my name is Casey Conlon. I am here today from the Mid-Hudson Library System from my house, but I work for the Mid-Hudson Library System. I am joined by Courtney Sahalis, who is the director at the Millbrook Library. I want to say hi, Courtney. Hello, everyone. Courtney and I actually used to work together at the Mid-Hudson Library System together, and it was a very special time in my life. But of course, you know, I want her to pursue her dreams, and she's out there at the Millbrook Library, but we have gotten back together to do this presentation. And I'm very excited to share with you some of the tools and some of the tactics and strategies that we've seen libraries use to create messages that people are going to remember and pass on, and that are gonna be effective for spreading in your community and in your library. So, as we go through the stuff today, as we go through the presentation, um, we're gonna be doing it online. So we wanted to have it be a little bit more interactive. A lot of us haven't gotten to see uh, any kind of face-to-face -face presentations in a while. I do miss those, uh, certainly, but I wanna invite you to, in the chat, to reply to any of these questions. Courtney and Becky can see uh, the responses that you're putting in in Feedloop or in Zoom. And so you are welcome to respond to any of these four questions or none of them. I understand that some of you may not wanna participate. It is 8 a.m. You may not have had as much coffee as I had. So we wanted to say hi, and I wanted to point out this interactive icon at the top. This little video game controller signifies that you are welcome to play along at home, and you'll see this throughout the presentation. There's a couple times when we're welcome you to chime in in the chat to answer a question or to provide an example of something that we've been working on. So again, without further ado, please you know, uh, you know, know, jump in and um, answer one of these questions if you feel up to it or all of them. For each question that you answer, there are no wrong answers here at this point in the presentation. For each question that you answer, you will get four Courtney points. And for every Courtney point, you can redeem it in your heart for a unending supply of enthusiasm for library services in your community. Again, those are redeemable in your heart and not through Nyla or anything like that. So as a quick rundown of today, we're going to be talking about sticky messages and how to create your own sticky message. That's the interactive part if you want to you know, try to duck out at that point so we don't look at you and ask you to participate. Really, we don't know. Then we're going to talk about what to do with those messages, how and where to share them so that people will actually uh, understand them and people uh, will hear them. Then we're going to do a little mapping exercise really quick where you'll ID some of the folks that you found um, or that we talked about in your community. And then we're going to do questions and answers. The slides for this presentation, if this question hasn't come in yet, are at at caseycollin.com slash Nyla2020. And there is a post there and there's a little download link and we had some technical difficulties with it about five minutes before the presentation, but it is fixed now and I was able to download it. Thank you to Becky for pointing out the technical issue that we had. So did we have any responses come in in the chat or are people still waking up here? No, we had a lot of responses. Oh. Um, we have uh, Bridget, who's a correctional facility librarian. Whoa, which welcome is pretty Bridget. cool. Um, we have Jennifer, who's an assistant director, and she says, I'm too blunt for my own good, always looking for help on how to say it. Oh, well, cool. We can definitely help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have lots of uh, library assistants, uh, marketing and adult services, oh, cool. uh, directors, um, Havistraw, King's Daughters Public Library. Oh, hey, Havistraw. <laughs> All right, I used to work there. Um, so we get, uh, lots of directors. It seems like lots of, lots of responses. All right. People are looking for good advocacy tools. Okay, cool. So I think that we're going to be able to help out with that today. But of course, there's always questions and our email will be available later as well. So sh sharing messages is important for all of us, um, whether you are involved in marketing directly or whether you're actually just trying to communicate with your staff. This has been a very tough year. Uh, the state uh, funding for library services, which affects the library system where I work, is down 22.6%. So we really need to be able to put together messages that are going to help people understand um, how important library services are and to carry those messages. We are also having an unprecedented time where a lot of our services are changing. A lot of them are moving online or we're doing them completely differently. And we need people to remember and to understand that we're still here and we're still doing these services and they can take advantage of them because people need their library. If you're trying to get people to join your friends group or volunteer to work at the library, you're gonna need a good message that people, that will impact people and have them, you know, wanna take action and do that. And finally, of course, or, you know, there's many other ways to share your messages and many other times that messages are useful, but even in communicating with your staff, if you are in a management position or your coworkers, if you wanna have people understand what you're trying to say. So those are some of the things we wanted to work on today. Uh, we're gonna get started now and we're gonna start thinking about messages and how to make messages stick. 
So when we think about messages in our own lives and messages that we've put together, we've probably intuited many of the things that we see here. Messages that people remember and messages that work make people pay attention. That's kind of obvious, right? Nobody's going to know or remember a message that they didn't see. We also need people to understand and remember the messages. If we can't understand what people are telling us or what the heck it means, then we're not going to be able to remember it and we're not going to be able to pass it on. We also need people to believe our messages. And this is a very big deal in 2020. We're all watching the election, right? My nails are all bitten down. They usually are, but even worse than normal um, because we have people who just believe things that are different than other people believe. And they just believe it very strongly. Uh, I believe that libraries, <laughs> I believe, I didn't mean to do that. But um, in libraries, we actually can make a case for many sides. So we don't have to really choose and get um, engrossed in a lot of these things when we're advocating for ourselves. Another really good way to make a message stick is to make people actually care. When you care about something, you are that much closer to acting. And ultimately, we do want people to act on the things that we're saying. We don't simply want people to know things. We want them to pass the information along or do something based on what we're telling them. So Dan and Chip Heath in their book Made to Stick actually set up this framework and they analyzed all these ads and they gave people this framework, this rubric to analyze a lot of effective ads. And they said that these things actually apply um, and line up with all of these things that we're trying to get people to do <clears throat> when we show them different messages. So getting people to pay attention, we want to give them something unexpected that's going to make them look up and pay attention. Make it concrete. If it's concrete, you can feel it with your five senses and then you can actually understand it better than if it's abstract credible. We want people to actually believe what's being said. How can we make messages that are going to do that? We'll look at that later. Emotional. If we can appeal to people's emotions, that's a short circuit to making them care and getting them closer to acting. And a story actually puts people in the story. If you can tell them a story, they will become the main character and they will be that much closer to acting. You might have noticed I skipped over simple. That's a setup step and that's the first one we're going to look at. But when you put them all together, you get this very unfortunate acronym and just it's very unfortunate because it's so darn close, right? And I apologize to all the librarians out there. And I know you're probably trying to think of an S. We're just going to move forward missing one S, okay? So the first part of success is to get down to the core of your message. And this is a setup step. And this is before we even start making the words for our message. So we want to strip away any extraneous ideas or any extraneous information. And we want to get down to the core of what we're actually trying to say. Uh, we're not making our message yet. We're just getting down to that idea of what we want people to know. Uh, the idea could be funding the library is a good investment or that um, people should use a library service or come to a library program or that people should help the library by volunteering. You want to get down to that one message. So when you think about getting down to your core, it's a uh, fun example of this is the um, fun, I guess, relative, uh, but a fun example of this is the inverted pyramid of a news story. And so all good news stories will have this inverted structure to them, wherein the first one or two sentences will actually have all the important information in the story. And as you read through the story, there will be more information that comes out, more details and then more background info. So when you hear somebody say, don't bury the lead, this is what they're talking about. The lead of the story is those first two sentences and that's the most important info. And don't bury the lead. And um, you know this whole structure is supposedly <laughs> comes from the Civil War era when uh, news reporters are using military telegraph lines, newspaper reporters to you know use Morse code do, 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 to send their messages back to the newspapers back home because remember there was no internet people weren't tweeting out this was the closest thing that they had and so these lines would often be cut by either the yankees or the confederates and they would cut the line of the military from the other side so that they couldn't have a strategic advantage of communication with the outside world and so the newspaper reporters also lost the ability to transmit their story but when they put the most important information up front they it didn't matter if the line got cut when they were halfway through because they could still run the story if they had just started with some kind of um you know background info then that wouldn't be something that they could run in the paper and information is very valuable and very important in that scenario so I want to illustrate this with another thing, with uh, another example, and this comes from a study and this comes from the book as well. And so we had, uh, they did a study and there was these 
uh, students and they asked these students and they said, all right, you have two options. You have a free night. What would you like to do? Would you like to go to a lecture by an author that you admire who is visiting for the evening? Or would you like to go to the library and study? And so when they asked students this question, 20% of the students said, I will go to the library and study. And 80% of the students said, I'm going to go see that lecture. So they ran the same, uh, the same study again, but they added a third option and really uh, only a second option, right? Because go to the library, despite what everybody's thinking, wasn't supposed to be an actual option. It was supposed to be the I give up option. And so when they presented people with a third option of watching a foreign film that they've been wanting to see, the number of people who said that they would go to the library actually went up. So it went from 20% to 40%. So the number of people who said that they would go to the library rather than do something doubled. And this is something that we see in people when they try to make decisions and when they try to process information. And it's called decision angst or decision fatigue or decision paralysis. And when we boil our information down to that core idea, we spare people from having to think about too many things. And I know it sounds sad, but we don't have a lot of time to communicate things to people. So we want to get it down to that core idea. And the other thing to mention here is that uh, another thing to kind of remember, a little anecdote is if, uh, or not an anecdote, but a little seed, I guess. <laughs> I can't think of a word. Um, so if you say three things, you risk saying nothing. So you want to focus on the one thing that you want to say. And I know this is really hard for all of us because in the library world, we see so much nuance and we want to make sure we're inclusive of everything and get all the information out. But we want to focus on that one thing that we're trying to say with that message. And then we want to start building our message. And so we want to get people's attention. And this has changed a lot since the book was written, but it's still true. Getting people's attention is very important and it's become a lot less easy because I think people have a lot less attention to give out. But the way our attention works and the way our brains work is our brain evolved to find things, and you'll probably see this in your life, is you find things and then you put them into a box. And so as you get older, you have more boxes, but you find things and then you put them in a box and you don't have to think about them anymore. They're classified and you're done. But when something pops up, and it doesn't fit in any of the boxes, then you actually have to expend brain power and think about it. People don't like doing this. Um, and it's an evolutionary response because once upon a time, if something was different, you really needed to pay attention to it because it might eat you. And that's what we have left over from here. So as people, we need to resolve things that are surprising. So here is a headline from a sort of clickbaity, but not a terrible article. And this is a uh, opportunity for you to participate interactively really quick. Um, do you know what's gonna happen next in this scenario? The other question is, do you care what happens next? I know what happens next and I will tell you. If a bunch of people say they don't care, um, judging by the chat, then I'm not gonna tell you. But I'm pretty sure that you're gonna tell me that you wanna know what happens next because we are programmed as people to want to find these things and to see why it's different. It's why we read mystery books and it's why we watch really bad movies all the way to the end. We just have to know what happens and who did it. And so did anybody have any um, interesting responses to this? Because this really violates everything that we know about successful human lion interactions, right? There should be a moat between these two or he needs a whip and a chair, I think, to actually tame the lion. So Casey, um, <clears throat> while we're waiting for people to respond, I was thinking about this last night when I couldn't sleep because the world is crumbling around us. And I was mm. thinking of like um, fun librarian clickbait headlines. So I was thinking of things like librarian oh. is asked to unjam the printer for the third time today. You won't believe what happens next. Or uh, oh, the amount okay, of vomit one. the children's librarian had to clean up off the bathroom floor will shock you. <laughs> oh. So I was thinking though, it can be kind of, um, kind of easier if you're thinking of trying to make something unexpected to start out by making it really clickbaity and kind of sensational and then work backwards from there. Um, yeah. Just a, a little tactic that might help people. So we have responses. Uh, the lion lets the man hug him. He rides the lion. The lion is sedated and falls on him. <laughs> Somebody said, Laura said some of <laughs> us haven't had enough coffee yet. <laughs> um, Okay. So, Carolyn said it's a library program, so it can only assume they sit down together and read a story. Uh, we have lots of oh. we have lots of guesses. It's very creative. <laughs> All right. So um, one of the important parts, uh, to Courtney's point too, is um, 
when, you know, the difference between clickbait and a story that's kind of like an interesting story that draws people in is whether this, uh, whether the uh, resolution to the story is post-dictable, not predictable, but post-dictable. Once you hear uh, the resolution to the story and say, I say, oh, that makes sense, you know? If it's like, it was all a dream, that's not post-dictable, that's annoying. Um, so then anyway, so this guy, he actually um, has worked with these lines for decades and he has a huge rapport with them and he's actually able to do things like get closer to them that any human being really ought to be able to. And so he uses pictures like this um, to advocate for uh, conservation of the lion's natural habitat. So he's totally okay in the end. He doesn't die, um, but it sort of challenges your expectations about what's going to happen. So if you can build this into your um, into your messaging, as Courtney described a little bit, that's going to really help and go a long way to um, attracting people's attention. Library has books, not a huge headline, right? Library has museum passes, that might catch people's attention. The other element, the first C is concrete. And when we talk about concrete, it means that we wanna provide things in a way that can be easily understood. So we wanna take abstract concepts and we wanna make them uh, very simple and as easy as possible. Something is concrete, if you wanna test it out, if you can uh, measure it or if you can actually feel it with one of your five senses. So we see libraries do this a lot with, um, budget votes or referendums. So a uh, figure like how much the library is increasing is its budget, whether it's $10,000 or $20,000 or $50,000 is not really relevant without context. And so what we have here is we have the Red Hook Library has taken a number about the library's budget increase and actually put it into context. And the context here is how much um, it will cost the household per year. And they further contextualized it by providing an example of something that somebody could actually buy with that amount of money that they will be paying additionally. And I would say they've gone even further and used something that I would say that is unexpected because a lot of people aren't buying lots of spools of string. Certainly some people are, but not a lot of people are out buying string every week. Um, so for $2.78, which is the cost per household, people now have a much better idea of how much it's actually going to cost um, when they go and vote on the library's budget increase. And they also have a super memorable thing. They can think of that spool of thread and how tiny it is, and how they can hold it in their hand. And so that's going to help the message uh, be understood by people. Another thing you can do to make things concrete is you can actually tie them to things that people already know. Canopy is a cool service. World's finest cinema now streaming with your library card. This is still pretty abstract for people just because they don't know it that well, I think. Um, so if you can tie this to something that people know already, like you might be able to say that this is like Netflix, but free with your library card, then it's gonna be more understood and people are gonna be taking it, people are gonna be able to take it up more quickly and they'll be able to share it as well. So the second C is credibility and we gotta make things credible. We have to make things that people can believe. And we believe things because our friends and our family do and we identify with certain groups and we think that the group would believe this. So we believe it as well. We also trust authorities and our experience sometimes leads us to believe things. So here's an example where we use authorities. Um, this comes from the Libraries Transform Initiative from ALA, and it says, because five out of five doctors agree that reading aloud to children supports brain development. So we tend to believe what doctors say for the most part. I know it's a troubling time that we're in right now, but usually doctors are people that we believe. Likewise, celebrities. We aspire to be like some celebrities and some celebrities will appeal to us. And if we see them using a certain product or practicing a certain lifestyle, then we are likely to do the same. Uh, I was just listening to a thing today and apparently uh, to get the polio vaccine moving, teenagers didn't want to do it. And so they had Elvis Presley, that old hound dog, he went on TV and he got a polio vaccination. And that's how they were able to turn the tide and tip some kids into actually getting the polio vaccine. So this message also has something in it and it's sort of uh, a little bit of uh, inbuilt credibility. And so when you read this, again, not a lot of people are gonna contest this and say, yeah, I don't think reading to children is helpful. 
nobody's really going to say that. So it has its own kind of credibility. And that's something that we call in the book, we call it the Sinatra test. And the Sinatra test comes from uh, his song, New York, New York. And in New York, New York, Sinatra says, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And so we know that that's true. We think about New York and we hold that up as a barometer and we say, you know what? Yep, it's tough to make it in New York. If you make it there, then you can make it anywhere. So if you can build in that kind of credibility and make it almost a parable out of the message that you're providing to people, it will have a lot of sticking power in their minds and they'll be able to carry it to other folks. So if you don't have access to Elvis Presley because he's dead or Beyonce or somebody else who can carry a message from your library, that's okay because somebody who is often more powerful at carrying a message and has more credibility is somebody who's called an anti-authority. And over here, we have an anti-authority. This is one, this is uh, just somebody who comes from the community in Phoenicia. And he says, my library, the Phoenicia library is the unofficial pickle barrel, the community center where folks not only seek out books, DVDs and knowledge via classes and internet, they also gather to chat and commiserate some hashtag library love from Robert Burke Warren so if you can't tell from the picture I'll give you a little context this guy is like a cool musician guy who plays music locally and sometimes plays at the library and if you see a picture of this guy and you see him saying this and you see him saying the library is cool and he's your neighbor and also like I said he's dressed really cool you know you're gonna think you know what the library is cool because you know there's no reason for him to say this. The library is not paying him. Are they knocking down his late fees? Is he that hard up for money to pay off those late fines at Phoenicia? I promise that he isn't, but people aren't thinking that anyway. People are like, oh, you know, that guy, you know, he's my neighbor. He must know. And so they look, read this and they believe it. And so they're more likely to internalize this message and to pass it on and to talk about it with other people. He's also, again, done uh, a little bit of the... Um, unpredictable he's, he's surprised people here by calling the library a pickle barrel i haven't had i haven't heard the library called a pickle barrel before this is a first but it's a good one so the other element uh, that we can include in our stories is we can make them emotional and our emotions make us care. It's sort of a short circuit when we see something that will actually move us to make us care about something and to pay attention to it and to actually um, you know, share it with other folks. It's gonna make us feel something and it's gonna make us pay attention. Statistics, uh, large groups of information don't appeal to us, but individuals and seeing people who are in need and have, putting a face on something, um, that will actually make people pay attention to a message and remember a message more and act on a message. When people feel something for um, what's happening or when people see a message and it makes them feel a certain way, they're much more likely to act. So the person or animal or whatever that people care about the most is actually themselves or maybe not the most, but they care about themselves a lot. And so one of the best ways to appeal to people emotionally is to appeal to their self-interest. And so we have a message here from Libraries Transform again, and it says, because audiobooks turn commutes into adventures. And so what they've done here is they've actually spelled out the direct benefit and not just the feature, but the benefit to you of using an audiobook. They didn't say because we've got audiobooks and leave it to you to determine why audiobooks are valuable. They said because we have audiobooks and they're going to make your commute suck less. And so this is important. And the only thing missing from this, and if you're writing a message that you want to actually appeal to somebody's self-interest, you want to include the word you where possible. When people read that word you, again, it goes right to their brain and they say, that's me. That's for me. My commutes are now going to be adventures. So keep that in mind. So the other emotional appeal, of course, and libraries do this very well, is, children, is uh, to show children or families. And people can look at uh, children and they'll identify with them way more quick, quickly than they would if it was just this passage about the great work that the library does. This is taken from a newsletter from the Pauling Library where I worked uh, some years ago when I was just a young man. Um, and here I am all wizened and sharing this knowledge with you. But anyway, uh, appealing to people, um, showing them uh, children, families, putting a face on things, even animals. A lot of uh, farm sanctuaries will have people sponsor a goat or a chicken and not necessarily like keeping the lights on over here and keeping all the animals warm because that this this is going to matter more to them and people are going to be more rewarded when they see that for um, acting on that impulse of that emotional impulse that you've provided them. 
So the final S is stories and stories motivate people to act because we can't help but put ourselves in the stories. So when you watch Lord of the Rings or if you read a book or if you listen to a book, you are constantly thinking, what would I do in this situation? So you might be thinking, am I strong enough to carry the ring like Frodo? Or would I take the eagles all the way to Mordor? Why would I walk the whole way? Um, but you're the whole time you're thinking about what would I do in this situation? And that's what we all find ourselves doing in stories. And you can create your own stories that are going to put people in these scenarios and make them think about what they would do. And you can use this to your advantage when you create stories in the library, stories about the library and stories that um, motivate people to act and actually um, do the things that you're trying to get them to do, whether it's fund the library, come to a program, or volunteer at the library. So there are a couple of sim simple plots. There's the creativity plot. If you think about Isaac Newton, when the apple fell on his head, that is a creativity plot, and that inspires us to do things in new and different ways. The connection plot is like a classic Good Samaritan plot, where somebody goes out of their way to help another person when they really didn't have to, and that inspires us also to help people and to love people. Uh, and the challenge plot, of course, too. The challenge plot is David and Goliath, where people overcome great odds or over overcome huge obstacles. And it makes us actually work harder and it makes us want to overcome obstacles. Um, so you can play along at home. I'm going to read this out. And if you would uh, identify any of the features that we saw before. This is a story from the Real People, Real Dollars campaign. Again, it comes from the Phoenicia Library where we saw Robert Burke Warren, the musician earlier. Um, so this is Elena, this is age seven. Elena reads a lot. Last year, her family saved $9,234 because Elena came to the Phoenicia Library for all her books movies and for tons of cool programs. And then the governor dun, 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 has decreased our library funding in his budget proposal and our communities need our legislators to stand up for libraries. We need your help. Won't you take two minutes to tell your New York state legis legislators how much your library means to you? Make your voice heard. And that is the call to action at the bottom, right? And that's what we want people to do. We want people to act and we want people to tell their legislators, um, you know, how important the library is to them. So Courtney, did anybody, was anybody able to identify any of the aspects, aspects of uh, success in this uh, story here? All right, so Alyssa says it's emotional. Heather says it's emotional, concrete, and it tells a story. Yeah, I think so. This, this is, is a challenge story, fun. right? The governor holding us down. Yeah, <laughs> and I think too, um, one of the most important things about this is the please share at the end. Um, and I think a lot of people are kind of scared to ask people to share their content or share their posts on social media, but it can, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking and it yeah. might actually encourage people to do it if they weren't going to already. Um, so don't be afraid to ask people to share your stuff. Um, Sarah says overcoming obstacles. Yeah. Bridget says it affects the family's pockets and that's a huge motivator for many. Yeah. Uh, Mary says it's a David and Goliath challenge story. Yeah, definitely. Laura says it's unexpected. It gets people's attention in addition to the emotional response. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of elements in here. It's definitely unexpected that she saves almost $10,000, I think, yeah. <laughs> using the library. People don't expect that. All right, so for everyone who provided an answer, you can have eight Courtney points. Good job, everybody. Hope you're keeping track. Becky can't keep track of them all. All right, so now we're up to the part where you get to participate again, and you can actually work on your own message. And so you can work on your own message thinking about the, um, the elements of success that we talked about, and you'll have a couple of minutes, and you can type something in there if you want to share your message. Um, we can share it out um, with the group here, or uh, people can see it in the chat. Um, and so, yeah, so we'll just give you a couple minutes to work on this. Um, we just wanted to give you a, a second to practice this, just to kind of exercise that muscle, right? To do a little bit of the old brain muscle memory to start getting you in the habit of trying to use these things and thinking through how you could use them in your library. So remember first, you wanna get down to your core message if possible. We're not giving you a lot of time. You know, normally you could take a lot of time to do this, but you know, we'll give you a couple of minutes. Casey, while you have some time, this is yeah. Becky here. I just wanted to say, um, you got some uh, shout outs on the chat about your impression for the uh, Telegraph. People really oh, appreciated okay. that. 
And I would just like to point out that Matt Bullerman was disappointed that the lion did not rip off the man's head. He gave a thumbs down for that. Oh, all right. <laughs> that sounds like an emotional response, though. So maybe. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, Casey, too, my favorite line so far of the day has been, if you don't have access to Elvis Presley because he's dead. <laughs> Coming um, soon, virtual Elvis, hologram Elvis. Probably. To your library. Um, so we have an answer from Ellen. The okay. library serves you from cradle to grave. Whoa. That definitely gets my attention. Yeah, that, yeah. that uh, is unexpected, yeah. We have a... a Response from David is, what's unusual about these shoes? Include picture of old shoes recovered from the wreck of the CSS Alabama. Oh. That's intriguing. Yeah. Now I want to know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Good job, David. You made me curious. <laughs> uh, Jennifer tells us Long Island's Elvis impersonator is reasonably priced. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's uh, the chat is important. You know, we get some networking and we get to find new ideas that Courtney and I maybe didn't have. <laughs> and me foolishly thinking the Elvis ship has sailed. And there it is right on Long Island. David said he was inspired by the lion with his, uh, his shoe post. Nice. Um, Will says modern life is exhausting. Don't you always want to find new ways to escape? More people went to their public library in 2019 than in the movie. Oh, I like that one. Yeah, me too. That's, that's definitely unexpected. Uh, Jody says, meet up with your best friends online. We are coming to your home for virtual trivia. Beat the champion and win bragging rights. Nice. I like that. That's got you in there, too. So that's yeah. good. Well, all right. Everybody who um, chimed in with one of those, you get 15 Courtney points. <laughs> um, and so we're actually going to move into talking about where and how you can actually share these messages with Courtney. All right. So, um, some of you may recognize the tipping point from Malcolm Gladwell's book of the same name. Um, so I'm just going to talk about this for a little bit. Uh, in Malcolm Gladwell's book, he says that small actions at the right time in the right place and with the right people can create a tipping point for anything from a product to an idea to a trend. So the way that I think about this is like a roller coaster. Um, so like you do a ton of work to go up the hill for the roller coaster and you share your messages at the right time in the right place and with the right people and you put out all this information and everybody sees it and everybody's inspired to act and finally when you reach the top of the hill that's when like things start happening for those of you who can't see my video like whenever i talk about this i have to make the roller coaster motion with my arm also known as the dolphin motion but it's like once you reach that point everything just takes off and people start doing things and everything that you want to happen magically happens except it's not like magic because there was a ton of work to get to that point um so when i was telling my dad that i was doing this presentation he's like oh well you have to use a quote from victor hugo uh, cause that's the type of guy my dad is. And I was like, what quote from Victor Hugo? He says, nothing is stronger than I, an idea whose time has come. And um, I think that really ties in well with this, this idea of the tipping point where um, if you have enough people behind something and it's the right time in the right place, things are gonna happen. Again, kind of like magic, but not really because it takes a ton of work. <laughs> All right, next slide, Casey. So today, we're going to share the secret recipe to potential success with you. We have to put the disclaimer in there because like there are outside variables and factors that may stop this from working somehow. But generally, if you have a sticky message, if you share your message in the right environment, and if you share your message with the right people, you're going to be successful. All right, so Casey has already talked a lot about the sticky message, but I just kind of wanted to highlight it again. And you already should know by now, a sticky message causes the idea to stick in the minds of your audience and influence their behavior. And I really want to highlight those last three words is influence their behavior. Um, so you can think of like a message in terms of three levels. On the first level is first getting a person to even see your message at all. That's, that's a success right there. The second level is getting people to see your message and then think about it. If they actually put brain power towards it, that's like another step up. And the third level is if you get people to see your message, think about, and then actually do something. And if you can achieve that level, um, then you know your message was really successful. 
So my example of this is the viral ALS uh, ice bucket challenge, which happened in 2014, which I could not believe it happened that long ago. Um, but if you don't remember, the ice bucket challenge helped raise over $220 million for ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And how it worked was participants were challenged to dump a bucket of ice water over their heads and nominate other people to do the same thing. And people had a time limit of 24 hours to complete the challenge after they were nominated. So I tried to upload uh, my video of the ice bucket challenge, which I posted on Facebook in 2014 apparently, but I couldn't get it to work. So instead you get this gif of Benedict Cumberbatch being soaked dramatically with ice water, which cracks me up every time I look at it. He looks like a lizard. So I think it's great. Um, why did this idea tip? It was eye catching and fun to watch. Like this is hilarious to me. I don't know about for the rest of you, but it's really fun to see people get shocked with ice water. Um, two, it got the right people involved. This was done by normal people at home and celebrities. It became a trend on social media and uh, lots of celebrities got into it. So that made people at home want to do it. They're like, oh, if Benedict Cumberbatch is doing it, I want to do it too. Uh, three, there was a sense of urgency around it with a time limit. You had a time limit of 24 hours to complete the challenge. And uh, four, it was for a good cause. It was raising money for, for research for a disease. And five, it was really easy to do. You can do this if you had a camera and a bucket of ice water. And it, it um, like, not, not that challenging to do. So that's all of those factors were a reason why this really took off on social media and why this challenge was able to raise so much money. So besides the sticky message, you really need the right environment. Um, it's important to know your community and what's happening happening in it, and this will help you know when the right time to ask for action is. Um, so an example of this is um, if you are in your community and a factory shut down recently and a lot of people lost their jobs, maybe don't do a 414 vote that year or maybe don't ask for money that year because people are in a rough spot and um, might get offended or hurt that the library is asking for money like, oh, the library needs money, so do I, like get over it. Um, so you have to kind of time your uh, messages to go out when it's appropriate. And I think we saw this a, um, a lot this year actually with a lot of libraries postponing their 414 votes because of COVID, um, because they felt it was not appropriate to ask for money in a time where people were really struggling and on an unemployment and um, losing their jobs with a lot of uncertainty in the future. Um, so. Next slide, Casey. <laughs> so um, the way you find out what's happening in your community is with public knowledge. And public knowledge can basically just help you learn about what's going on in your community and with the people in your community and be more effective with your messaging and ambassador mission. So a great way to gain public knowledge is um, a method called turning outward. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but it's basically uh, you set up these community conversations um, throughout your community. You hold them at like the deli, maybe like a local church, the firehouse, you can do one at the library. Um, obviously this is pre-COVID, <laughs> um, but you basically hold these community conversations and you ask people like, what do you want to get from your community? And like, why are things not like that? What do we need to do to change these things? And um, you don't ask about the library per se, you ask people about what they want from their community specifically. Um, and this can be really helpful, not just to like find the right environment and like know what's going on in your community, but it can also help you develop um, like long-term plans and things like that. Because if you know what people want and what they're missing, you can um, develop the library's strategy for the future to address those needs. Um, Another method besides the community conversations are also ask exercises, which is basically you ask people four questions that take like five minutes, um, but it, I believe they're like, what kind of community do you want to live in? Um, why is this important to you? Uh, how is it different from how you see things now? And what needs to happen to make these things happen? Uh, then not exactly word for word, but that's basically the gist of it. All right. Um, so on top of the sticky message and the right environment, you also need the right people. So there's something called the Pareto Principle, which basically says that 80% of consequences come from 20% of the causes. Um, so in what, to make that relevant to what we're talking about, it's basically 20% of the people you reach will be 80% responsible for sharing your idea. And according to Malcolm Gladwell, 
The success of any kind of social epidemic is heavily dependent on the involvement of people with a particular and rare set of social gifts. Um, so, next slide. <laughs> Courtney, I just wanted to say really quick, oh, yeah. um, I, I noticed this um, when I was working in the library and I would go out to town board meetings and the chamber of commerce meetings and the school board meetings and the, um, the rotary meetings. Uh, it seems that there's like 20 people maybe in a town of like 10,000 people who are running everything in the town. And I think you'll see that. And so, you know, you don't need to necessarily know every single citizen or every single household in a community um, where your library is, but there are key people that are good to know because they'll help you connect to all of the other people. Definitely. Um, so there's kind of three categories of the right people that you should be aware of. So the first is mavens. Mavens are people who spread influence by sharing their knowledge and people trust that when they adopt something or buy something, they've made an informed decision about it. And this person's mission is to educate and help others. And a lot of you on this, um, in this presentation are probably mavens because I feel like this is a very librarian thing to do uh, is where you want to learn about a ton of stuff and then share it with everybody and those people know that you've made an informed decision on it and you did your research. Um, the way that I think about this is um, I am not a maven in certain aspects like when I go to buy something like say a vacuum cleaner or a blender I'll just be like hey that one's kind of cheap and I like the color I'll get that. Um, my husband Michael does his research. He will go on to re read every review and go to multiple websites and he will do his research and we will get the best blender that is out there. So he's in charge of buying kitchen appliances, not me, um, because I'm just like, hey, it's blue. I like it. Um, but mavens are generally people who get a bunch of knowledge. They want to learn about things. They want to know what the best things are, and then they want to share it with other people. So the second category are people who are connectors. These are people who know everyone. They have connections to a ton of different social networks and have a really strong ability to connect people who would work well together. So my example here is uh, probably nobody knows her, but um, her name is Penny Hickman and she was a former Pleasant Valley Town Supervisor, which is a town that I grew up in. And I just remember hearing her name so often when I was growing up because she was part of everything. She knew everybody. and. Um, Thinking now, um, I have a staff member here at the library, her name is Diana, and she grew up in Millbrook, and she also knows everyone. Like, everyone who comes in the library, oh, hi, Diana, hi, how are you doing? How's your mom, how's your sister, et cetera. And it's, these are the people that are really important um, to help spread your message because they will get it out to so many different types of social networks um, that you don't really have access to just by yourself. And the third category are people who are salespeople. And these are people who are naturally persuasive. They are very charismatic and enthusiastic, and they don't need to try hard to convince people to believe something. So my example for this is my brother Tom. My brother Tom is younger than me, but always managed to talk me into doing stupid things when we were little <laughs> because he was very naturally persuasive and charismatic. And he's one of these people that if you um, if you meet him, you know him, you like like him instantly, and he can talk you into doing anything. So um, the the one thing that we didn't end up doing when we were younger is um, tying our bedroom sheets together and hanging out like the third story window in our house and trying to repel down down the wall because uh, my common sense kicked in. <laughs> I said no, maybe that's not a great idea. But generally, uh, he talked me into a lot of things that were pretty fun and got us into some trouble sometimes. Um, but chances are you know somebody like this in your life who is naturally persuasive, they're funny, they're charming, and once they start talking to you, you start to believe everything they say. All right, so now is an uh, opportunity for another interactive section. Um, who do you know that fits into these categories of maven connectors and salespeople? Um, I invite you to put a person and their category into the chat. It can be somebody famous. It can be somebody that you know from your town. It can be a relative, um, but just put the person name in and where they fall into. It's just meant to start to get you think about um, how to kind of pick out these people that you know in your life. Courtney, what do you, uh, where would you put yourself in here, you think? Um. I would say Maven for some things, but not everything. <laughs> um, 
I don't, I would like to be a connector, uh, but I'm not quite there yet. And I would really love to be a salesperson, um, but I'd feel like that doesn't come easily to me. So, uh, so let's see, we got some responses. Oh, so Bridget says often the connectors are also salespeople. Wouldn't you agree? And yes, totally. People can fit into multiple categories. They don't have to be just in one. Um, and I think uh, for those of you who know Rebecca Smith Aldridge from the Mid Hudson Library System, I think she's a great example of somebody that fits into all these categories. She has expert knowledge. She has a ton of social connections, and she's really good at convincing you uh, to believe in things like sustainability, um, which is great. Um, so Alyssa says she knows somebody named Frank who's a social connector. Will says his dad is both a connector and a salesman. Tara says, I think Casey is a great salesperson. I agree, Tara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicole says two of our board members are definitely connectors. Alyssa says uh, her brother Sam is a salesperson. I'm, I'm sorry, Alyssa. I don't know if you got talked into doing a bunch of crazy things like I did. <laughs> um, we have lots of connectors. Uh, oh, Katie from the Rosendale Library says, when I think of a connector, I think of Liz Potter at the Phoenicia Library. Oh, yeah. Yep. Definitely, Katie. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we got a lot of responses. This is great. Ellen says, at least two of our board members fit into all these categories. And Ellen, you are so lucky um, that you have two board members that, that fit into that. Uh, Bridget says she immediately wrote down our village mayor's name while I was talking. She knows everyone and can get anything done. Um, and so it's Katie, good to, you know, think about these folks and, you know, making sure you target them with your messages, you know, and making yes. sure you have a message that appeals to those folks. The message for the mayor might be different than if somebody is on the PTA or something and they were a really good connector. The president of the PTA, PS, is going to be a very good connector. And even probably anybody <laughs> on the PTA is probably going to be a good connector. Yeah, this is great. There's There are a ton of responses that came in and um, this hopefully this just helped you start thinking about who are the right people to reach out to in your community to spread your message. All right. If people are keeping track at home, how many points do people get for these ones, Courtney? What's that? How many points do they get for their responses on this one? Oh, I'd say uh, 15. Oh, this is all important. Right. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Everybody's keeping tally at home. Courtney, you're going to tell us a little bit more about communication outlets, right? Yeah, so now that we've kind of discussed about um, how to create a sticky message, the importance of a sticky message, the importance of the right environment, and the importance of knowing the right people, um, now we're going to talk about how to effectively share your sticky messages. Um, so the most effective way to share your message is face-to-face -face conversations. Um, so I did some research online and I found um, some quotes from people who have worked in government and uh, thinking about this from a mostly advocacy perspective. Um, so people have said that in-person engagement is always get better, going to be better than online. And the truth is that more weight is given to groups of constituents who show up in person. Um, this is why Advocacy Day um, in Albany is so important for us is because uh, the, the legislators get to meet real library supporters who get to tell their stories and uh, they get to hear, hear their happy stories or sad stories. They get to see the emotion behind it and they get to see that people really care. Obviously, with COVID, this has become much more difficult. Um, and face-to-face -face is mostly now happening through Zoom meetings, which is still effective, I think, but it, you definitely um, miss some of the connection there. So hopefully we'll be able to get back to this soon when it's safe to do so, um, because it's definitely the most effective way to spread your messages. The second is high volume phone calls. So um, one person who worked in government says that phone calls have to be dealt with when they occur and they can't be ignored. Ignored. A large volume of phone calls can be overwhelming for office staffers, but that means that their bosses hear about it. So basically, you call enough, you annoy the heck out of the office staffers, and they complain it to their claim, complain about it to their boss. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been like working in a place where the phone is just ringing off the hook all the time, but it can be exhausting. Um, so definitely, after face to face, phone calls are the second best option to spread your message. 
Um, the third was actually letters to newspapers. Um, so somebody said, if you want to get your representative's attention, a letter to the editor in one of your state's five to 10 biggest newspapers that mentions them specifically by name is the way to go. Um, people still read newspapers, believe it or not, not as much as in the past, but it's still pretty effective. And um, when representatives see their name in print, it's kind of like a, a, they look for that specifically. Um, I will say kind of a disclaimer on this is to use this sparingly and to use it strategically. Um, if a representative in government does something that you don't like, don't react emotionally and like put in a scathing letter to the editor type of thing in your local newspaper, um, because that's not the right way to go. It's something to use be used strategically and not really emotionally. Um, so just keep that in mind. So for email, um, petition slash adv advocacy organization campaigns carry less weight for us than somebody in government. It's just too easy for someone to click on a button in an email. It doesn't mean much. However, email is better than nothing. If uh, representatives of government get enough emails, they are going to notice it and they are going to pay attention. And it's not as effective as having a face-to-face -face conversation, but it is still something and better than taking no action at all. So when Nyla sends out those advocacy emails, if you can do nothing else, make sure you respond to these and send an email to your, your representatives in government. And the last is social media. Um, so. Somebody said reaching out via things like Facebook or Twitter aren't going to be very effective. Staffers check these mediums occasionally, but they're largely ignored. Um, but I think this has really changed in the last couple of years, especially in 2020, because we can't have these face to face conversations and we can't go to Albany for Advocacy Day. Um, so I think a lot of representatives and legislators are much more responsive to social media now than they have in the past, because this is their main way of communicating and connecting with their constituents. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about uh, social media now in the time of COVID-19. Um, so I think when everything shut down uh, in March and April, um, social media became flooded as everybody was so desperate to stay connected online, whether this was your family members on Facebook or brands on Instagram trying to get your attention with ads. Um, people are really tired of being online and on social media, and yet they can't stop doom scrolling. And if you don't know what doom scrolling is, it's basically scrolling through your social media feeds, just reading negative articles and feeling like the world is ending. Um, it's not healthy for your mental health at all, but people can't stop because this is the way that you feel connected now. Um, and because social media was flooded with uh, things like family members posts and new advertisements and health information and so much stuff because it was the only way that people could really communicate um, with a large group of people, it takes so much more to make your message stick right now because there's so much more content on social media. So if, before it was already difficult enough to get your message out there and to be, get people to see it and act on it, now you're competing with so much more information. Um, so things have definitely changed in terms of social media in, in the last couple months. Um, so how can you make sure that people see your messages. Um, share your posts with the right people. Share your posts with the connectors, mavens, the salespeople, and ask them to share it with their social media followers. Um, share it in Facebook groups. Share share your like your library events. Share your advocacy information. Share your important things that you want people to know in Facebook groups. If you have board members who fall into those categories of mavens, connectors, or salespeople, share it with them and ask them to share it with their their friends and family. Um, and just make sure that you share your stuff with the right people so it can get out to as many people as possible. Uh, sorry, Casey. <laughs> you have to grab people's attention in a really dramatic and simple way to get them to notice you. And this is kind of where the clickbait comes in again, because people are, are just scrolling through their news feeds and scrolling and they're seeing a lot of the same stuff. But if they see something that is really unexpected, it's going to stand out on, to them and they're going to stop and pay attention for a second, which is hopefully all you need to get them to pay attention for longer. Um, and the third thing is to know uh, what the right environment is for um, your social media posts to be shared in. Know what social media platform will be the most effective for reaching people who are most likely to be interested in what you are sharing. So uh, how do you do that? <laughs> um, so you have to pick the right social media platform to use. And uh, I've 
done a couple of presentations on social media and libraries and a lot of the times I get the question like oh I'm just one person running the social media accounts how do I keep track of Twitter Facebook Instagram YouTube and all that all of this stuff and I'd say that you don't have to it's better to do one thing really well than to do three things like mediocre um, so if all you can do is run a Facebook account and you don't really have time for Twitter or Instagram that's okay um, just make sure you run your Facebook account really, really well <laughs> so people people are interested in it and respond to it. Um, but I'd say you don't have to feel like you have to be on every single social media platform. It's okay if you can only do one or two, um, because I know there's a lot of small libraries out there um, who oftentimes there's one person doing all the social media and marketing. So uh, don't feel like you have to be on everything um, kind of all the time because you'll drive yourself crazy <laughs> if you're just one person. Um, so when you're picking the right platform that you want to focus on, if you're looking at focusing on just one or one or two, um, you have to, it's kind of really helpful to know the age demographics for each platform. So Facebook is really good for reaching ages 35 and up. Um, it's definitely shifted towards an older demographic as the people who started using Facebook when it first came out get older. Um, but it's also been adopted by a lot of um, uh, seniors as well. I know there's lots of grandparents that have Facebook pages now and use them actively, uh, sometimes to spread lots of misinformation. So <laughs> Facebook is, is good for reaching um, kind of an older population in terms of social media. Uh, so for Instagram, Instagram is really good at for reaching ages 18 to 34. It's kind of like the young people social media platform. Um, so if your message is more targeted towards younger people, if you're doing a program on like adulting 101 or something and you want to share it out, uh, Instagram is definitely the way to go. And then Twitter I thought was interesting. Out of all the platforms, it had the highest percentage of um, 13 to 17 year olds using it. But honestly, they're not gonna follow you on Twitter. They're following meme accounts and things that make them laugh. They're not looking for what the library is posting. Um, so don't feel bad if you're not reaching this age group on Twitter. Um, they're probably on TikTok anyway. <laughs> um, but Twitter is really good for reaching organizations and businesses uh, in your community. I think a lot of people use it professionally um, and people who use it personally tend to lean towards like pithy things about political commentary and things like that. Um, so Twitter is definitely a good way to reach out to like your local PTA or your local schools. Um, I know um, a couple of our school districts around this area are very active on Twitter and it's, it's good for making partnerships and connections um, with those people. So I wanted to give an example of a social media post that you could do that has all the elements that Casey talked about in creating a sticky message. Um, so Casey, I have arrows that pop up if you hit like the, the space bar. All right. <laughs> so the first one is simple. Um, so the, our simple statement is libraries save real people real dollars every day. It's simple. It's easy to understand. Libraries save people money. Our second thing is unexpected. So our unexpected thing is your library gives, card gives you access to over 2 million items that have a combined worth of over $45 million. Like that's a lot of money and you get all that for free. That's kind of mind blowing. Um, three, credible. Um, so here we share some information about like the state and assembly are expected to re release their one house budget bills next week. And these are responses to the governor's executive budget uh, in which he proposes to cut library aid. This is like a credible fact information. Uh, concrete. Here we have a concrete image of people. Like these are people in your community. You can see them. You can see how much money they're saving using the library. It's like you can't really dispute that. It's a, it's a thing that people can really see and connect with. Uh, the, there's a huge emotional aspect with all these photos too. There's tons of photos of children. There's photos of seniors. I'm pretty sure the, the person in the middle with the green sweater is holding a dog. You have like the trifecta of cuteness <laughs> going on with, with older people, with children and animals. Like how can you respond negatively to this? Um, and the sixth aspect, the th sixth thing is stories, is that all these people have stories and they're all part of your community. And when you see that like so many people were impacted by their library in such an important way, um, it makes you realize how important libraries really are. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying that you got this. Um, you all showed up at eight o'clock in the morning for a presentation on how to create effective messages. And uh, that takes a lot of dedication and Good for you, um, but really,
the first step to getting started with this is being interested in and in wanting to learn more. Um, so you are already on the right track to creating effective messages and sharing out with them, them out with your community and being successful. So um, I want to say good job and you've totally got this. And I think we all need to hear this more uh, every day is the way 2020 is going anyway. So good job, everybody. <laughs> All right, thank you, Courtney. So today we went over sticky messages, how and where to share them, and then we have questions and answers, although I know Becky is gonna get out that hook to pull us off the stage because it's nine o'clock. Um, you can reach out to us, of course, um, at our email addresses here, cconlin at midhudson or director at Mill millbrooklibrary.org, and you can access the slides, and Becky will put them up later also in um, feed loop um, here at this link. Um, I, you know, we're here to take questions, but, you know, I understand that it is um, 9.01 and I believe that there is a session now as well. There's a session at 9.15. Yeah, 9.15. Wow. Uh, Claudia, incoming president Claudia Depkin and outgoing president Dr. Jen Cannell are going to have a conversation. So people have about 15 minutes to hop over to that. Um, thank you, Courtney and Casey, so much. That was a wonderful presentation and it, you created and shared very meaningful messages and I appreciate it. Um, for anyone still listening, I just want to kind of plug uh, Carolyn uh, Glauda Bennett's program. It's on, on demand. It's called Visualizing a More Dynamic Annual Report. And I think it ties in very well to a lot of what Courtney and Casey were talking about, but specifically targeted towards annual reports. So if you are looking for more of this information, I would check out that presentation. So again, thanks everyone and hop over to see the NILA President Forum starting in a few minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. Thank you, Courtney.